to another edition of the Brit Blitz podcast. My name's Stuart Wright, and today's guest is screenwriter Meg Lafoe. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. My pleasure, my pleasure. Now, you're Oscar-nominated for the wonderful script uh, of 2015's Inside Out, which is yeah. where people might might know you in a kind of famous sense. Uh, oh, well, writers aren't famous, but yes, okay. <laughs> if, writer, if writers are famous. If writers if, were famous. Okay, if writers were famous. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I, I came to you via your fantastic uh, podcast, the screenwriters, La- screenwriting life that you co-host with uh, Lorraine McKenna. Which, yes. if I'm honest with you, and I get the chance to say this to you because we're on a podcast together, has been a life raft or two in different oh, parts good. of the journey. Believe you me. Good, good. Well, that was literally why we did it. Uh, we we did it to be support both emotional and craft support uh, mm. as for people out there writing, writing screenplays. And, but, but people who listen to plays are, are right. Sorry. Who uh, people who write plays are listening and actors are listening and directors. And cause it's much more, it's also about just the life of an artist. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's one of the key things that gripped me with what you do. Cause you, you tackle the emotional side of it as much as the, cause the craft side is, is a very literal thing. There is there is good examples right. or bad examples that we can learn from them. But when we're going through our ups and downs, they're not so predictive. And understanding yeah. that's normal is really hard to come to terms with. And, and I it's feel even that. more than normal. It's necessary. Okay. Because okay. it's an art. It's an art, not a craft. And the art is coming from you being brave and daring to go out onto edges and to let yourself go up and then down and to stay in the downs and and see what's there and to bring it into the work. So to me, that that feeling of being on an edge and up and down and maybe I should give up and, oh my God, this was a great day writing. Oh my God, it was horrible. Number one, every every creative I know goes through it. I don't care how many Academy Awards they've won. And it is part of the process to great work, I think. Absolutely. And it was... And for me, for a, when I was in the weeds for a bit, because um, it, 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 I was, I think I must have listened to a lot of interviews where I, I, the most industrious writers ever were interviewed. So I was hearing these conversations of people that got up at five and wrote on one project, had had hardly any food, and then wrote on another project while solving problems while solving problems on the other project. I'm thinking. Oh my god! I mustn't be a writer because I no right. I, Everybody thinks that that's like normal. <laughs> I'm like, no, I cannot no. comprehend that. And then, and I mentioned this guy before we were before we started recording. I then heard an interview with Michael Arn, and it was like a revelation. He he was asked by Jeff Goldsmith on the Q and A podcast. He said to him, and this he said, "So tell me your process for writing." And he said, "I get up about seven and I have a coffee. Then I read the newspaper." Then I have another coffee. Then I procrastinate till I hate myself. And, I, and I'd never heard anyone admit this. I'm thinking, this is the guy that wrote Toy Story 3 and he's telling us that... I know. He proc- and then Abby Morgan was on a later episode talking about writing the Suffragette movie. And she was wa- she was warning us, or warning herself at the same time, of not falling down a YouTube hole. I'm thinking, <laughs> Abby Morgan falls down YouTube holes. I fall down YouTube holes. I heard an interview with Aaron Sorkin and he said, this is how he writes. He lays on the couch and watch ESPN. That's how he <laughs> writes. And he procrastinates and he's thinking about it. But I don't know. I just think that that is the part that is, that can be for many people. It's not everybody. Mm. Um, uh, the way it goes. I literally always have this idea that now I'm going to, every day I'm going to promise to be in my chair at this time. And I'm going to write until this time. And I'm committed to this. And then I do it for a week. And then I don't know what happens. It's just, <laughs> I don't. I, I'm a. I'm a. I'm a. I'm a purge writer. I like write and write and write and write and write and write and write, and I can't do anything else. And then I just stop. I'm either in. Maybe I'm a binge writer. I'm in, or I'm not doing it. And that's so you got to kind of forgive yourself for that because that's just how my brain works. That's how the muses pour it. I don't know what to say. I mean, when you once you have kids, you do have to be more disciplined because yeah. there's a lot of life to um to be involved in. And then I did have to be more disciplined in terms of time or else nothing would get done. And then once you work for a company like Pixar, where you're working in a more collaborative way, of course, there's meetings and you got to show up at 930 and be ready. And whether you're inspired or in the mood, it doesn't really matter. And I have found 
that the truth is, even if you're not in the mood and you're not inspired, it'll come eventually. It will come. The tap will to open maybe creakily and there'll be maybe rusty water at first, but it will come. It will, it will start. Yeah. I mean, I, maybe it's panic. And maybe it's panic motive, but you know, it, it, it does happen eventually. You've given me a lovely segue there. One of the things I've been, I've, been, I've wanted to ask you all this while by listening to the show, thinking about Inside Out is that a, a part of that Michael Arndt interview was he was asked about, you know, getting such a great script, how proud he would be of, of having written one. And he said, well, look, he said, it's got my name on it, but having worked at Pixar to develop this script, he said, there's 20 story consultants or whatever the, the nomenclature he used that have written this with me. I haven't written this on my own. And if you asked me tomorrow to write another one, I wouldn't be able to do it on my own either. Um, can you, I mean, can you talk about the benefits of that for you, that you see I mean, oh, say, yeah. of that yeah, kind of yeah. collaborative process while still being the author? <laughs> well, animation very much, I mean, the way I've experienced it, and I can't say it's true for everyone, but it's more like a combination between feature and television. Mm. So, you know, a TV room, when you, when you see who wrote an episode, well, there could be 12 writers behind, you know, working on that episode with that writer. They happen to be the one who took it and wrote it and they are writing it, mm. right? But a lot of the ideas and the way it was broken and the way it fits into the, into the season, that's a room of writers, right? And it's part of the reason we're on strike right now is because that room has become <laughs> one. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Animation, my experience, especially at Pixar, was very much that. So um, you start with yourself, the writer and the director, and if there's a co-director, um, and then the head of story. So story is where they're drawing the movie, but they're not animating it. They're just doing storyboards. And you do that. You storyboard a movie eight times and show it and get notes. Mm. So uh, that process of storyboarding, those storyboard artists. So I think that's what he, what you were remembering. It's not story consultants. It's storyboard artists. Okay. Okay. And story, storyboard artists are literally setting camera They're in terms of the boards, they're doing the acting. Um, and they're very, they're, they're not just your, you know, the, the phrase is I'm not, you know, they're not just your wrist. They're not just there to draw and then walk away. Mm. They're there to be storytellers. Right. So they have input. If they think of something funnier or, have a line of dialogue or they have, they want to talk about why is this happening? Um, so they're very, very involved. And so that whole process of, you know, myself and the director and the head of story might be breaking the story, but, and then I go and write it. Hmm. But then once it's handed to the storyboard artist, that process starts again of, of it being very creative and lots of feedback and, you know, and at Pixar, then you go into edit and you edit those storyboards together and then you show it like a movie. So there's, it is being made many, many times. Um, and everybody, you know, is a creative being and a storyteller from the editor, right? It's mm. going through edit. So suddenly it's coming back to you and they're like, this doesn't cut together or we got to fix this or this, we put this in order and it doesn't work and we want to move the order. Um, then once you, now you're starting to make the movie as you're writing it, because um, it's starting to go into layout and, or so maybe the production design, they, you know, change the location. Well, it's a road movie. So that's going to change the story because <laughs> you can't just, you know, so everybody is, the thing that I love about Pixar is every department is pushing themselves creatively and everybody pretty much feels like they're walking around in their underwear. If you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, when you've pushed yourself creatively to try something you have no idea at some point, is this good? Is this bad? I thought it was good, but now maybe now it's bad. That feeling of vulnerability, all those artists in that building are doing that. Everybody's pushing themselves to that. And I think that's why the movies are so good because everybody's willing to be an artist and be vulnerable and try things. And the only rule I ever heard at, at Pixar was fail fast. Okay. They want you, their expectation is you will fail because you're pushing out to an edge. You're pushing the story to something original, to something we haven't seen, to something deeply emotional and vulnerable. Those are, when you do that and keep pushing to the edge, you're going to fail. That's just part of the process. Mm. Um, it's how you know where the edge is or how you know that isn't the direction I wanted to go or that didn't work, but we learned this. And it's really important that we learned this. We had to go through this and fail in order to learn this and bring it back. And that constant revision and deep, deep revision is, I believe, why the movies are so good. 
No, and I think I think within the Facebook group, there's a viral quote from Ray Bradbury talking about quantity yeah. over quality. In terms yes, of- I've said it. I couldn't believe it. I have been saying this on the podcast for years that what especially emerging writers need to understand, it is not about qu- quality. It's just about quantity. How much can you write? How many pages can you get done? How many scripts can you get done? How many versions of scripts can you done? Can you write three scripts, you know, five, 10 times each revisions? It is quantity in order for your brain to start understanding it and get the craft level up. And then there was a quote by Ray Bradbury who said the exact same thing, <laughs> that it is about quantity. There, I have been uh, I've been uh, backed up by a genius. Um, so... And it's hard because I think it's easier to overthink, um, speaking as an overthinker, and getting really down in the weeds on your script of it's not perfect, it's not right, and I need to keep changing this tiny little thing and that little thing, and the quality isn't there, and people are going to say it's it's typical, people are going to say it's not original, and all that voice in your head. And meanwhile, if you talk to people like Andrew Stanton or any of these amazing writers, they're just like, go, go, you have 15 drafts to go, just keep going, just... What is it? Just get it out. Okay, look at it. Throw it away. Go again. Throw it away. Go again. Um, you can't. You can't stop yourself with all of that kind of worry and overthinking. I I, have, I give myself a little. I have an exercise that I try and do every day. I don't do it every day, but most days I do, which is <clears throat> addressing that in a very small way, where I write three pages of stream of consciousness based on a photograph, so a different photograph every oh. day and see where that goes. And then I condense that to a tweet, which gives me a kind of a, is there a character? Is there a story? Right. And that's all that's I've got. Lovely. I never go back to them as, as, as their own things, but it's just a, a case of just it's working. It's like an stuff. exercise to get yourself warmed up, right? Yeah. To open the door, to but open it, the tap. But it has led to three screenplays. I mean, it took 700 of them, 700 <laughs> stream of consciousness, but it's interesting that that way of exploring ideas. I love that. Is, Where'd you get your, where do you get your photograph? Well, right now, I'm showing you a picture for those listening. It's the, a, a guidebook called Secret London. So it's just oh, full of pictures. Wow. Every, every other page is an image of something odd oh, in I London. I love that. And previous to that, I did, uh, there's a book called Accidentally Wes Anderson, which is photographs uh-huh, that look yep, like the from yep. Wes Anderson movie. My wife got yep, me yep. it. And, and to be honest with you, what, what, there's this weird thing that happens is that you suddenly read the book in a very different way because every day you're just looking at a page. Which right. is no way of read, no way to read a book, but it really fo- it makes the book much more memorable. But then when you're done, you're done with the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. You don't ever want to see it Especially again. If you've written, I love that. I love that as an exercise. I'm a little bit stuck right now in terms of writing, so maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll start doing that in the morning just to try to get the get some uh, water in this dry riverbed. I think I'm a little bit scared of what I'm writing. So my brain is stopping and stopping it, clamping it down. Weirdly, it came as a result. That that led to me then using the same. I don't know what it is about writing three pages of A5 because it's a, it's it's an arbitrary measure that I've made up. Right. But just for any other story problems now, I'll just do three pages of. Oh, I love that. Three form thinking yes. of a character. Yes. And it gives me backstory and things and ideas about who they are. Yeah, that I can either little, use or not use or, or just fail quickly. Reform thinking. I love that. You know, it's funny. On the podcast, we tell people to do barf drafts of their script just mm. as fast as you can. You can't go back. You can't keep revising. Just go forward. Because mm. in my opinion, you don't know the first act till you know the third act. Yeah. You don't even know what it... Halfway through, the, the main character might change. Like, just get it out. Let the dreamer dream. Mm. Let the dreamer write. Um, but people don't like the... The word uh, barf draft. So maybe free form, free form draft. I don't live. I'll use that instead. Well, vomit. I, I like. I like the vom- the vomit draft was always was always something <laughs> that I embraced. It's uh, it's it it gets you it gets you from point A to point B, and the, the whole thing of the clay on the table as opposed to yeah, no yeah. clay at all. Which no is, clay at all, and I, you're always surprised. You're always surprised by what comes up that you didn't even know was lurking down there in your subconscious, and oh, there it is, and you're like, wow, okay, and. Uh, I, I I love it. I love the experience. I know it's not for everybody, but even if you you can't imagine yourself writing a barf draft, I would try it once. Just mm. take a week, take ten days, just see what happens. But so I, I, I saw some. Do it again. I read some analysis of this about time taken to write a script, and it was like this idea of if you plan the thing within an inch of its life, it will take you this long. If you barf draft it and then revise it, it will take you just as long as if you've done it iteratively. So there's actually no. There's the argument being there's no benefit 
to being no, so, there's no... so planning. It's just, you're just going to get there. And you might go a little deeper with the birth draft. Not, I, think so. I mean, I can't promise, but you're going to go a little <laughs> deeper. I think. Well, let us, let us now peek into the world of your okay. film fandom. I, I like yes. to talk to people about three films that have impacted everything in your adult life. You've given me three films. So for the benefit of anyone who's joining this podcast for the first time, the rules are simple. I will prompt Meg with the title of one of them and we'll start and the clock will start with five minutes. And then at I'm the end nervous. <laughs> Please don't be. It's just a little bit of jeopardy. It's not what's the right answer? I'm so type A. What is the right answer? What am I supposed to say? So when the alarm goes off, we'll stop. I mean, obviously finish your thought. Or we may right. we may have some supplementary conversation to have, but essentially it's to keep us to around about five minutes per film. And really, this is about your memory of the film, why it's important to you, maybe who you saw it with, where you saw it, or just how it made you okay. feel. I think one of the things you talked about recently on an episode that having talked to you before we started recording, you recorded a couple of months ago, but to me it's recent, um, is the um the notion of a you know that film that talks to you because it's a mass mm. media, but suddenly you're watching a movie going, I feel exactly the same, which yeah. which is a beautiful way. I mean, you talk a bit about the idea of the films that really drew you in. You mentioned like right. Steel Magnolias, Dead Poets Society, Awakenings. Right. I mean, Ghost and Jacob's Ladder always makes me laugh because it's the same year. I know. The same screenwriter. I know. And yet you couldn't get thematic, you couldn't get more different in terms of two talk films. Talk about tone. Yeah. Talk about tone. Tone change, but right? but also about not about people the, the, the whole adage of people not knowing anything, and I, I know right. the quotes misused and everything, but the the, the, right. the, the the sentiment's true. When Bruce Joel Rubin presented a treatment for Ghost when he was in the middle of Jacob's Ladder to his manager, his manager said, "For God's sake, will you stop coming up with this stupid? Th- you can just give me something commercial." And you're like, "Wow, <laughs> a, a film that defined a decade." <laughs> yes, exactly. Which I love that. I love that story. Right then, your first movie in your list mm-hmm. that you've given to me is 1993's The Piano. Yes, yes, yes. Now, I believe this is a film you saw, because I know you talked about this, this is a film you saw when you were in your producing days, and it was kind of one of the ones that did Less. turn you to writing almost. I was a producer, Um. well... That's really self-aggrandizing. I was an executive for a producer. Mm. So I was a creative executive. I might even been at the cusp of of, uh, assistant creative uh, executive. And um, the head of the company, Stuart Kleiman, I was working with Jodie Foster at her company, had heard of a new um, writer, a new director coming out of uh, Australia. So we all went into a screening room um, and you know, no popcorn, no, just a, just what, you know, the place you go in your executive, you sit down, you watch movies and then you get up and you talk about it. It's, it's can be a very intellectual experience. Um, and a lot of times as executives, you're thinking about, you know, what can we do? And in, it, you're kind of, it's like a job watching mm. a movie sometimes yeah. as an executive. Um, but when you watch the piano, it can't be a job. It can't be anything but experiencing that movie. And it was one of the few times in my life, I've had other times, but where I just felt like I am meeting somebody, an artist, so important, such a voice for her generation, for us, for women. Um, I just thought it was, yeah, I was blown away. I, I'll rem- I remember that the lights came up and none of us moved and of us talked. And uh, because we all just needed to sit there and it, and let the movie be with us. Mm. Um, and, you know, to do that at work with your bosses and it tells you how powerful the film experience was. And I, I, I have this memory and maybe it's, maybe it's a trick of your memory and it didn't happen. But my memory is we all looked at Jody and she just said, wow. <laughs> and uh, it was so beautiful. The visuals, I, I think it affected me personally because of, um, you know, it's, 1993. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd just come out of advertising in New York City before I was at this job. Hmm. And, you know, when I was in advertising in New York City, there was no word, there was no such word as sexual harassment or, you know, I grew up in a very different time than even today. Yeah. Um, and to see, um, now I'm working for a very powerful woman. Um, 
So I'm, I'm being exposed every day to a woman who has a voice, who's incredibly intelligent, who's an artist, how she's seeing the world, how she's dealing with her business. And so it's, it's, I'm like a sponge yeah. and, um, and, and I'm so lucky. And now for us to sit together and watch a movie about literally about a woman without a voice who does not speak, mm. um, the amazing Holly Hunter. And, but she's speaking through her art. She's speaking through her piano playing and she doesn't leave, live, you know, even get to make her own choices. Um, so to watch that with Jody, who was teaching me so much about those themes, um, and what's awakening her um, in terms of her relationship with Harvey Keitel and her daughter. And so to watch, I think really, really impactful for me was to watch a child of that age be put in that position and um, feeling betrayed by her own mother and yet just a real force herself, that little girl. Mm. Um, I think that that also had a lot of reverberations for me um, in terms of, I think inside I was that little girl who was kind of a weirdo and funny and, you know, a bit of a smart aleck. But I don't know that I ever let it out because it wasn't a safe thing to let out, especially as a girl in the 1970s. Mm. Um, so I just, for me, the film spoke to me in all my different ages. It spoke to me personally. It spoke to me at a job. It spoke to me on so many levels. And it really started to teach me about visual storytelling. And I I would have told you I knew what visual storytelling was. Yeah. But all of the shading she's doing of plot of what's coming and um, and just her, her beautiful visual way of telling the story mm. from huge, big, big, big wide shots where the women are very, very small to intimate moment, tiny, tiny moments, really, really close in of texture and light. And um, I, it just blew me away. And, and it's it's one of those great examples of while there there are very visceral moments of violence, actually, what the film does amazingly is the, it, it translates emotional violence in a way that you feel. Yes, because obviously that's a very internal yes. thing that we have to understand. But the film leaves you without doubt the power of emotional violence on on the, on the victim or the survivor of emotional violence. And I love TV shows or movies where it's so subtle. Okay, one. Well, okay, I'm going to finish up my thought. Finish your thought, please. It, it's so subtle that, but you're so deeply invested in the internal and emotional life of these characters that you know if they just move a glass, you go, oh, oh my god, you know, like you would only understand what that means because you've watched this whole movie and you know what that means that he did that, you know. <laughs> uh, so I I love those movies. Right then, your third, your second choice is. Yes. The first in the Three Colors trilogy, Three Colors Blue, starring yes. Juliet Binoche and directed by Krzysztof Kilof Kilofsky. Kilosowski? Kislovsky, I believe. I did try and practice, and no matter how many times I try and practice <laughs> it, I get it wrong the minute I try and say it's it. It's all good. It's um, all good. And obviously, blue is, is the, the red, white, and blue is the colors of the flag. Yes. But also, blue is, uh, is, a, is a color of a depression, but also serenity in. In terms mm -hmm. of water, so there's a mm -hmm. lovely that contradiction. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got we've got the character Julie played by Bernard, who you know survives a car accident, and despite her daughter and husband dying in that accident, we we get a sense of her being liberated or get a get a look into what what that liberation is like. And I believe, I mean, I I didn't know this when I saw it. It's a while since I've seen it, but reading around the film, you know, there's a view that the blue of the three colors blue represents liberty in terms of the liberty, ah, equality, and fraternity of the French Republic. So, um, and it's the idea, I think, of uh, whether or not we we are our relationships, or we can start afresh, and therefore, do we ever let our past go? Does and past grief is a very, a very huge anchor in terms of the past because there, there's a relationship that ended, i.e., the, the mother daughter, the mother right. husband, the wife husband. Um, right. So for you, what what where does what's this what what's the film for you? Why is this an an, an important film for you in terms of your in your film memories? Um, well, if I think about where I was, I believe my husband and I were not yet married, but living together in a tiny little Santa Monica bungalow. Right, and I believe we saw it on DVD first. I don't think we saw it in this cinema. Mm -hmm. um, but it was one of those, you know, you're sitting in the dark. 
and watching something that, again, I don't think I even had any expectation about it because um, I think he wanted to watch it because he's a Kozlowski fan. Okay. And this was the first in the in the trilogy coming out. Um, so it was a very intimate, um, quiet experience. And the movie is very intimate and very quiet in its own way, even though it's also quite um, loud in a beautiful way. Hmm. Um, so for me... Again, it's about voice, but in a different way. The, what what I took away from it um, emotionally and what I love is that, you know, she loses her husband and her daughter in a car crash. And the very first thing she does is try to kill herself because she's letting us know that she can't survive the, mm. the grief. She can't survive this level of a life smashed into a thousand pieces. She can't, you know, and the beautiful, her daughter had a, a mylar blue balloon that she was kind of uh, playing with out of the window. And you never see the daughter or the husband. You just see the car crash, which mm. is amazing. Yeah. Um, but that little hand in the balloon is all you need. Again, what be beautiful visual storytelling to know that just a little hand in this beautiful color blue, that it comes to represent what she can't allow in her life, which is any joy, any connection to life, because it brings back all the pain. Mm. And so you're, to me, what I'm watching is a woman. It's funny because sometimes when I teach or consult, people are like, well, it's European. So she's not active because she's European. And I'm like, no, no. Look at Blue. It's about as indie as you can get. Yeah. And she is trying not to feel anything. She is trying to be inactive. She is trying to become dead inside. And yet she's doing it in incredibly active ways, dramatically active ways how she's she literally sells the house she she or she leaves the house she moves to a different place she won't let any color in her life and then sometimes just to just to there's this amazing shot where just to um thicken her skin literally like so she can feel nothing she just runs her hand along a rough wall and scrapes her hand and all the intimate ways she is trying so desperately to armor herself up and feel nothing and let the pain out in, in controlled ways. It's just spectacular. And I love as a filmmaker that then his way of his, what he's saying to her and to us is that you can't do it. You can't deaden yourself that much. You can't live but not live because things keep smashing into her. And he uses music because her husband was a composer and she was a composer. And there's a secret in here that's slowly coming out, which mm. is that maybe she helps compose that music. Maybe she actually composed the music he's so famous for. And so music just keeps smashing, smashing into her. So she's in a pool and she's swimming and she's swimming laps, trying to think of nothing, think of nothing, think of nothing, feel nothing, feel nothing. And then boom, boom, this music just crashes into her mind. And it's so amazing. And people are smashing into her and, and she has to deal with it. And and her cat and she finds mice in her apartment, which makes her feel something, right? Because she gets an adrenaline boost. So then she gets a cat. And it's just all of these. She goes to see her mother, who has got clearly dementia. And but that all starts to bring stuff up in her too. So it's all these intimate, amazing I mean, the, observations. The, the Alzheimer's is is a really interesting sort of playoff in the yes. sense of if you have no memory, are you free? But then obviously we see very quickly. That you're not. That free you're at not. All. So it's he's constantly asking her to look at it, look at it. But is this what you want to be? Yeah. Do you do you want to really have no connections? And then you know the young man who came to the accident finds her and talks to her about it and his experience of the accident. And it's such an it, it's such a sophisticated and yet beautifully simple idea mm. of and I I use it a lot in teaching in terms of thematic. You know, people think that theme is some intellectual idea. It's not. It's emotional. And like, what is he trying to say to us? You know, can you can you live and not live? Can you deaden yourself that much? And the answer in every scene is no. Mm. And once she lets go of the idea of she ha can't deaden herself, she has to be in the world, the music starts coming and the secrets start coming that her husband actually had an affair and he's had a baby, but she can let it all go and she can hand them the house and she can start to find a lover herself and compose. And suddenly she's, she is coming back to life in a way bigger than she was before. Mm. Right. That, that this incredible journey that she takes in these really small, tiny moments 
But the journey she takes is immense. It's an immense, immense uh, journey that she takes. I mean, I mean, and, and also, I think one of the things you're saying there about European and active, I think, I think that sometimes that's confusing. That there's not really a what you call a strict plot because the theme, the themes are more, are more of an, it's more of an exploration of the themes, and you could add, right. you could add to what you were saying, sort of suffering is part of life. You know, and that's kind right. of you, you could walk away from the film thinking, certainly thinking that, and and therefore, if you can accept that, I mean, I don't know if you've ever read. Um, Becker's Denial of Death, which is kind of a... No. So the, it's a book about this idea of, as children, we're not afraid because we don't think about death. And we reach like right. about 11 or 12, and suddenly we're conscious of our own mortality, and then we spend the rest of our lives worrying about dying. <laughs> right. <laughs> as a, in yeah, a kind of... Yeah, I'd say that in a simplistic way, but, but right. I think it kind of gets to the point. And he said, and in his book, he basically says, if we can accept we will die, then we can live, which I think is... Is in blue. Is like if we if if you can if you can kept, if you can engage with what's going on around you, no matter what your past is. But loss will be part of life. Yeah. Loss will yeah. be part of life. And yet, and you know, that's what we talked about in terms of being an artist. Loss fuels the art, and that's mm. why we have art so that we all don't feel alone in the fear of death. We don't feel alone in that vulnerability. We don't feel alone in the joy that then is taken away. Um, yeah, I just and what's amazing about Blue is he gets so granular and so human and so much about the human condition that you can start to see yourself in it in different ways. Yeah. Right. Um, and that's what I'm always trying to get people to do is to be with their own writing, is to be brave enough to go into that what we call on the show lava, you know, of something incredibly painful and then be active about it mm. um in as a character, you know, so that we can all, you know, I don't think any of us over the loss would do be as extreme as she is. Yeah. But in her, by her being so extreme, we get to have a catharsis and learn something and maybe make a transformation in a quite, not quite so extreme way. But, but, but it begs, about everything. We but don't have to say, suffer but, such an extreme loss. Yeah. I gotta say it begs the question just on a very simple level. What would I do if I was faced with such grief? Because yeah. you'll get, give, you're given an example of how someone deals with it. And you, and, and it's almost well, like, almost that film lived example Gives you the and opportunity. I feel like I feel like you you intuitively know, even though it might be in your unconscious, that you have suffered loss. Mm. You didn't maybe suffer this grand of a loss of a child, but you have suffered some loss in your life. Everybody mm. has, and everybody will. Um, and and it's also so much about identity in terms of she didn't even really fully accept who she is as a composer and a person until she suffered this loss, until everything, that old life was ripped away from her. Mm. So it's not just that loss happens. To me, the movie is not just saying suffering happens. It's saying life happens after the suffering. Life happens because of the suffering. It is a crucial, beautiful part of life too. It's not just something to be avoided or endured. Um, that within it, within that, uh, life will come back. And isn't that beautiful? Yeah, I mean, and, and you 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 sort of expanded on that in, in in the conversation about what movies made you want to write about this idea of asking questions about humanity and who we are and about connection and the idea that fleeting connection is what film can do really well because we can find mm -hmm. we can get that moment of deep connection with with what is a fleeting moment in a movie because we identify with it. No, you can't predict what that's going to be. You can't predict what film's no. going to make you do it. But we as writers, no. almost kind of, that's what we well, should we be Well, we have to do it for, for ourselves. We yeah. have to be that brave to put ourselves out there that deeply, that intimately, so that then other people see themselves. Because we're the brave ones that go into the breach, you know, and talk about it and what we see and feel about ourselves and what we've suffered and not suffered. Uh, it doesn't always have to be suffering. Though even even comedians, I the, when I meet them, I'm like, wow, you're dark. <laughs> you are... <laughs> You, they're 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 kind of they're not light and cheerful people. A lot of comedians. Uh, it's coming from the suffering. It's coming from the sorrow. Even all the all the fun and and joy that we we. I take. mean, I mean, I, I must admit, I can I can get carried away in an enthusiastic way about things that are not necessarily pleasant because I'm beginning to sort of make a connection or I can see a story. Right. But I'll be talking to my wife, who's saying to me, Stuart, we're in a cafe. <laughs> just, just, just wait till we leave. You know, it's like, <laughs> and it, I love that. You know, the hairs I are just racing, that. and you can't stop them. But like, you, you know, there's a time and a place, obviously. Um, well, we're moving on to your final of your three, um, a biopic on a grand scale. I do believe. 
yeah. I think it's safe to say. Amadeus, directed by Malice Foreman. And mm. a film that, I mean, this is just, I mean, it was a little bit of tidbit I found out about it because, I mean, it obviously cleaned up at the Oscars with Best Picture, Best Director, mm. Best Art Direction, Best Cinematography, Best Editing, and Best Sound. But mm. it's in, weirdly, it's it's one of five Best Picture winners, ironically, that there's five, that never was top five box office in its opening weekend. Which, mm. is, which are kind of, you know, uh, The English Patient, funny enough, the same producer of that one right. as, as Amadeus, Hurt Locker, The Artist, and Birdman, all all never made top five box office when, uh, when well, they... Well, I don't know that Amadeus is a... I wouldn't call it a, you know, a movie you're going to go see in the mall. You know what I mean? And I by mm. the way, I go to the, mo- I go to the mall every weekend and see movies, so don't get me wrong. I love them. But um, I just happened to be able to see it again. I on uh, the big screen because they played it over at the Academy Museum. Okay. And I took I took my son who's 20. Yeah. And my other son who is special needs. And I did not know if he was going to make it through because it's a long movie. I didn't know if he was going to be able to follow the story. Hmm. Um, you know what? He sat there so quiet. And I don't know that how much he understood of it, but boy, he got it. He got it because yeah. Milos Forman is telling such a visual story that even if you don't understand some of the subtleties that are going on, he's understanding the challenges and the plot and the and uh emotionally that this guy is jealous right mm. and uh he really all of these movies deeply put you inside of the emotional point of view of the main character yeah you know you meet mozart through salieri's view of him mm. you know you're not meeting mozart first and then meeting salieri and no we see mozart as a child, childish, um, arrogant, kind of um, trashy guy, right? Mm. Because that's how Salieri sees him, right? So, of course, if that's how Salieri sees him, what is the first scene where he meets Mozart? And it's so good. He's walking around this huge party saying, who could who could the genius be? This, this person I've admired my whole life. I'm finally going to get to meet him. I've admired him since I was a boy. He's held Mozart up as the genius, as the as somebody who can speak to God, right? In the, in terms of his context, mm. he just wants to praise God, and that God speaks through this man. Who could it be? And he's walking around this party, looking at all of these classic debonair young men who are just exactly what you would think Mozart is. And then he follows some food into a room because he's hungry and. He's kind of sneaking some food and all of a sudden, bow, here comes a guy is chasing a woman who's screaming and giggling and he's he's cr- so crass and he's grabbing her and they're rolling on the on the carpet and he's playing game a word game with her and he's clearly very smart, the word game he's playing. But the what he's asking her is so crude. And, you know, I think that Salieri is enjoying it watching this because it's just like a car wreck to watch. And yet all of a sudden you hear music and all of a sudden this guy goes stop my music and you're like and you, you have a moment with Salieri like oh my god that's Mozart it's <laughs> you're so deeply in it you know you're it, all the textures and feeling and everything all all of everything is firing in that movie on full cylinders of where he's trying to put you emotionally in every scene you know it was so genius the way the playwright and screenwriter Peter Shaver created this biopic because, you know, when you do a biopic, you, your head can get all twisted up and is it, but that didn't really happen. And I'm kind of making that up and I'm smooshing people together and maybe I shouldn't. And mm. it has to be the way it happened. But you know what? He's a guy in an insane asylum telling you a story. So it can be anything you want because he's crazy. Like he's crazy. But also the point of view of not doing it directly from Mozart's point. Well, Yes, there's two things. One is I would, ne- you know, it's very, very hard. I'm never going to say never, but it's very hard to take the point of view of the genius. Yeah. Because who who in, who in the audience understands what that's like yeah. to be somebody who has, who has God speaking to them through music? Who? Mm. Nobody. But we all know what it feels like to be Salieri, who's like, wait a minute, wait yeah. a minute. Yeah. That asshole gets to be the talented one? What? Mm. We all have felt that be that on a baseball diamond when you're in little league or where, you know, at work right now, we all have felt that. Um, so it's a much better position to take somebody standing next to the famous person yeah. um, versus the famous person. But I also love that he's an insane asylum. So you can do whatever you want because did Salieri actually try to kill Mozart? No, of course. That's, it's just, a, it, it's what he believes in his head. 
Um, and so again, just the visual storytelling of, of how he took that play and elevated it. I forgot until I saw it again that the opening title card says Peter Schaefer's Amadeus. It does not say Milos Forman. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, I suppose if he started never, off life as a- I don't think that would ever happen today. I mean, my husband was like, I think it won the Pulitzer. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. I don't think it, I don't know that that would happen today. Um, but th- that's not why I love him, of course. But I, uh, small side note. I, I just, I, Amadeus to me is um, such a amazing, again, look, here's my theme coming up. Mm. Um, a guy who wants to have a voice. He wants to sing God's praises and he's not as good as this jerk. <laughs> and that this is, a, I believe that you have thematics that you love in movies. And this is an answer to that question of having voice that goes very dark. It's the tragic version. It's the, when out of, out of, out of just rage that you can't have a voice, you mm. become a murderer. You become a murderer and a destroyer of voice, of somebody else's voice, a destroyer of that. So it's a kind of a tragic answer to the question about voice. Weirdly, this, I mean, not many people have done this comparison normally, but if you've ever seen Michael Winterbottom's film 24 Hour Party People, which is about the music scene. I love Michael Winterbottom, but I have not seen that one. So that's that does a very it, it plays a very does a very similar thing where it plays with myth and truth to tell the story because the myth is better than the truth. You know, right. it knows there's a lot of myth around the story because rock and roll's full of it. And that's right. what makes rock and roll exciting. But at the center of it is and, and I remember because I grew, it's, it's set in the region I grew up in, in in Britain. So essentially, the coolest guy, as far as the music label goes, that gave us New Order and Joy Division and all those kind of bands is a guy called Anthony H. Wilson. But if you grew up in the northwest of England, he was also a bumbling TV presenter who did magazine articles about, as the film begins, paragliding in the hills. So you just see this crazy man out of control, hang gliding (laughs) down the hills on a rainy day in Britain. And you're like, what, that man? is the guy that gave us New Order. How is this possible? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have to remember that as writers, you know, people want to see characters that are, you know, a couple degrees out from where we all are. <laughs> They're, you know, they are unique. They are doing things that we wouldn't do. Yeah. Um, even if you're somebody like Juliet Binoche, who's going to try to be normal, try to be nothing, the way she tries to be nothing is incredibly unique and brave and and slightly nuts. And so that it's so fun to watch. Right. Mm. Um, I think we forget that sometimes. I think we forget. And, you know, you you're especially for we, we do that with all our supporting characters, but the main characters get kind of flat and they're reacting to everything because I think that we unconsciously believe we are the main character. Right. And yeah. we believe unconsciously that life is just happening to us. But of course, once you're not a child anymore, that's not true. You are building your own life with every choice you make. Every moment of your life is a choice, right? So you're creating your own life. So it's, your character has to be creating their own life and the story as well. Absolutely. Well, look, we're uh, we're at the end of three films that have impacted there we go. everything in your adult life. And I'm very grateful for your sharing your thoughts and memories of The Piano, Three Colors Blue, and Amadeus. Um uh, one last question, I suppose. Is there anything yeah. that you want to you want to shine a light on, uh, whether a project you're doing or a project that somebody close to you is doing that you want to? Oh, um, well, I just finished up uh, Inside Out two, and that okay. was super fun to be back in the Pixar process. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, we're it was it's I don't know what I'm allowed to say, <laughs> which okay. is nothing. Well, I can say nothing. Okay, let me. That's I, what I can say. Getting back into the Pixar process, then what could I ask you then? This isn't about the promoting the film, right. but having been through it once before for the mm-hmm. for the for the inside out one, yeah. going through it again, what new things did you learn or what surprises oh. did you find in the writing process where ca- I guess you can perceive it's going to be this way, but obviously there's the challenge no, it never of the is. Yeah, and it never it's is. It's never what you think. It never it's never what you think. No, no, no artist or, or no creative artistic experience is ever going to be what you think. And we're all going to start out and cre- you have to make yourself naive again and say, it's going to work out and it's going to be great. And I know exactly how it's going to go. And then immediately you go off a cliff or, you know, something falls in front of you. Uh, you know, doing a sequel is hard. That's all I can say is it's mm. hard. And uh, 
you know, you can be kind of, you know, cavalier about it. Like, oh, I can do a sequel. And I, I've watched a lot of great sequels. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, there's nothing like it. And I, and I will say talking to people who've written sequels was helpful because they understood. There's yeah. no, you can't understand it until you get in it. And uh, just uh, uh, the challenge of it. It's, it's challenging because you want it to be as, as to have connection to the original and, and how wonderful that was and yet be new. And it's got to be new. Got to take you somewhere new. I was going to say it's like the toughest existential problem is that uh, of a unusual kind of challenge of a page one rewrite, and yet you've got to sort of jettison off what was before <laughs> into a page one rewrite of something that becomes new and separate, right? while also being a friend of. Well, the thing. when you wrote the when you helped write the first one, you can't even blame those writers. <laughs> You can't even be like, "Why well, who would do that? Who would come up with that?" Oh yeah, we did. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, look, um, I, I won't, I won't keep you going on that because obviously it's not, it's not a big, it's not a big yeah. public thing yet. So, well, it just gives me to say thank you very much for joining us on the Britflix podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was fun. Britflix.